choir always sounds good, but they sounded good this morning. <laughs> so I want to sketch out for you where we're going to go on this sermon. We're going to start with some history. I like my history. We're going to move to the present, and then we're going to wind up perhaps in a prophetic future. But we're going to start with some history. As Unitarian Universalists, our fifth principle says that we affirm and promote the rights of conscience and the use of the democratic process in our congregations and in society at large. The history of our religious ancestors, as I talked about last week in the sermon on, Mary, on Marilyn Robinson, our religious ancestors go way, way back, and we find as we go back that they were often, in some sense, on the leading edge of structuring society in a democratic way. Our religious ancestors way, way back in Geneva, Switzerland, established elected councils. Then as that faith moved north into the Netherlands, we find that with the move of the Radical Reformation into the Netherlands, that the Dutch ousted the Habsburg monarchy and started choosing their own leaders. And then, as that faith moved farther north into England, our religious ancestors fought a civil war in England, overthrew the British crown, and experimented with a decade of parliamentary rule in the 1660s. And it was the religious ancestors of the Unitarians and the Universalists who came to Massachusetts in the 17th century and established their democratic practices both in civil and religious life. This is not a triumphalist history I'm telling, by the way. I'm going to critique it in just a minute. So our religious ancestors, the ancestors of Unitarians and Universalists, the Congregationalists, in 1648 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, created a document that they called the Cambridge Platform that set forth how they would run their churches. And the Cambridge Platform set forth that the church would use the democratic process in the selection of church leaders. Here's what they wrote. A church being free cannot become subject to any minister but by a free election. And if the church have the power to choose their officers and ministers then in the case of manifest unworthiness and delinquency, have the power also to depose them. For to open and shut, to choose and refuse, to constitute in office and remove from office are acts belonging to the same power. And I'd like to point out that 370 years later, our church rules haven't changed. These same rules are found in our church bylaws, although a little less poetic now. You choose your minister, you choose your board members, your officers, your trustees, and in the case of manifest unworthiness or delinquency, the manifest unworthiness or delinquency of the board president, or the endowment trustee, or the minister, you can vote democratically to remove us from office. 1648. So the New England Congregational Churches of 1648 were perfectly harmonious democracies, right? <laughs> well, no. These rules place a tremendous power in the hands of church members, but they also, history tells us, they also set off a fight, a bitter fight over who could be considered a church member, who was included, who was inside. To be a member at that time, you had to be a man. More than likely, you had to own some property. And there was also a religious requirement for membership, which was that you had to go and present a testimony, a convincing testimony with evidence of your salvation. And the leaders of the church had to find your testimony convincing. And then they would welcome you into membership. Those were the requirements of church membership then. Now, in that decade, something was happening. There'd been a baby boom about a decade and a half earlier. And now, in the 1650s, I'm not going to stay in the history, but 
The history is interesting to me. I don't know if it's interesting to you. In the 1650s, there had been all those children of the baby boom were starting to become adults. And it was a big generation, and so the older generation was outnumbered. The demographics were not in their favor. And so started a movement in churches to suppress the vote. They began to select who they let in to control who could become a member. They even created a new membership category that they called halfway membership, <laughs> which was membership without the right to vote. And this tension, this tension actually continued in congregational and then Unitarian churches all the way up to the early 1800s when the halfway members in a little town called Dedham sued the full members. And they went to court. And the court decided who counted as a member of the church. And it just so happened that they went in front of a liberal judge. And the liberal judge ruled that the halfway members actually had the right to become full members. Yet they had the, the church in that little town, the members sued each other for democratic control over the church. <clears throat> Next week in our service, we're going to be recognizing new members, so you might keep that story <laughs> in mind. <laughs> but it's true, it's true that in a congregation, each individual member, each individual vote has a lot of significance. What I'm going to ask you to do is hold these two truths simultaneously. One truth is that the democratic forms practiced by our religious forebears were more democratic than could be found just about anywhere else at the time, even progressive by the standards of the day, and at the same time, at the same time, the form of democracy they practiced was deeply flawed. In both civic life and congregational life, suffrage was restricted on the basis of gender, of class, even creed. <clears throat> we romanticize the classic town hall meeting, but we have to reconcile that romantic vision with the knowledge that Native Americans who lived in those same places certainly weren't being welcomed into the town hall to vote on how things should be run. The root of the word democracy is the Greek word demos. Say that word with me. Say demos. Demos. Say it again. Demos. Demos. The word demos actually means something like village or neighborhood. It refers to a subsection, a part within a larger political and societal whole. The word demos can also refer, can also refer to a person who resides in a village or a neighborhood. It's a term that does not convey status or wealth or privilege or power. And if you ask me how to translate demos today, I might say villagers, or maybe folks, or maybe y'all. Sometimes that sounds all y'all. Sounds a little bit odd coming out of my mouth. It means ordinary, everyday, common people. Demos. I think about it like that song from Sesame Street. Who are the people in your neighborhood? The people that you meet each day? Not who are the rich people and who are the poor people, not who are the privileged people and who are the disenfranchised people, not who are the people who matter. The people in your neighborhood, period. And here's the truth. That the epic of democracy is the story of a struggle, a constant struggle over who gets to be counted as part of that demos. Who's included, who is meant when we say us. And on one hand, there have always been forces that have tried to expand and enlarge who gets to be a part of that demos. And on the other hand, there have always been counter forces, often powerful forces, that have tried to limit and shrink and exclude who gets to be a part of that demos. There have always been those who have tried to expand who we mean when we say we. The suffragettes who won women the right to vote, 
and led to the passage of the 19th Amendment. The Civil Rights Movement, the people who marched and bled and died in Selma, Alabama for the right to vote, and who won the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Us this weekend, yesterday in the church with all souls and community church went together, we were part of that movement of those trying to expand who we mean when we say we. And on the other side, there have always been the dirty tricks of those trying to restrict, those trying to exclude who gets counted as a part of the village. In the past, this looked like poll taxes and literacy tests and armed white supremacists conspiring to intimidate and threaten, injure, and even murder African Americans who tried to cast the ballot. It looked like mobs of men sent to intimidate and assault and beat women who attempted to vote. And today, this attempt to shrink, to shrink and to minimize who is considered part of the Demos looks like voter ID laws that require the types of identification that poor people, who are disproportionately people of color, and students, and the elderly, and the disabled are less likely to have. This attempt to minimize and to exclude people from the Demos looks like passing voter ID laws and then closing Department of Motor Vehicle offices in places where people of color live. It looks like restricting and shrinking the early voting period after the research shows that people of color are more likely to vote early. It looks like cutting Sunday voting, cutting Sunday voting in response to African American churches offering souls to the polls. Between 2012 and 2016, 868 early voting sites closed in the South. Say that again, between 2012 and 2016, 868 early voting sites closed in the South. Here in North Carolina, there are 20% fewer early voting locations in 2018 than there were in 2014. Today, this attempt to narrow who is considered part of the demos, who is part of the us, looks like purging the voter rolls an abuse of the rules with the intention of disenfranchising voters in minority communities. It looks like gerrymandering. It looks like banning felons from voting and then implementing a criminal justice system with deep racial bias and deep racial disparities. And at the same time, at the very same time that there's all this voter suppression taking place across so much of our country, there is also in some cases, in some places, too few cases, too few places, but some, in some there is real progress being made to expand and enlarge and increase voting rights. What's the opposite of voter suppression? Voter promotion? Voter expansion? I know we don't have a word for that. That's pretty telling. And so we find in some states like Oregon, have implemented automatic voter registration. In fact, they make you jump through hoops if you want to opt out from being registered to vote. In some states like Colorado, have implemented voting by mail. No lines, no having to take off work, no having to figure out where your polling place is. You can vote in your pajamas on your couch. <laughs> some states like Virginia are working to restore the voting rights of felons. This weekend, as we welcomed the Reed Project here in North Carolina, Unitarian Universalists were all over Florida, working in support of a ballot measure which would restore voting rights for felons. And some towns and counties in the United States have gone even farther with voter expansion. A few dozen places in the United States are now inviting non-citizens to vote in local and municipal elections. Last year, College Park, Maryland, home to the University of Maryland, we might think of it as the Chapel Hill of Maryland, <laughs> became the largest city in the United States to expand voting rights to all residents, regardless of citizenship. For them, this was, at one level, an issue of fairness and justice. After all, all residents pay taxes. 
All residents pay property taxes, all residents pay sales taxes, all residents pay municipal taxes. And if we're going to celebrate in our nation's history people dumping tea into a harbor a couple centuries ago while proclaiming no taxation without representation, then maybe we ought to be consistent now. So on one level, it's about fairness. But on a deeper level, these cities and towns that are expanding voting rights in local elections, local elections regardless of citizenship, realize that it does really take a demos. They are affirming that their village, their neighborhood, their community, their community, community church, is a better community when all souls are invited to participate. <laughs> See what I did there? But seriously, the schools, the schools are stronger when everyone is invited to vote for the school board. There's a better relationship with the police when everyone gets to vote for the sheriff. So if we want to talk about suppression, we might talk about the other, the vision. Professor, Professor Carol Anderson warns that it is unsustainable <coughs> to have a nation with different laws for different people. She quotes Abraham Lincoln reminding us that a nation cannot endure half slave and half free. It is simply untenable. A nation cannot endure half slave and half free. A church cannot endure if it's made up of full members and half members. A society cannot endure with expansive suffrage in some states and limited, narrow, oppressive, racist suffrage in others. The Brennan Center for Justice, a leading organization working to further democracy and oppose voter suppression, ran a project recently in which they asked people whose voting rights have been restored, who won the right to vote, to talk about what the vote meant to them. And I want to read one voice from that project. She writes, I never voted in an election before this one. I'm going to start reading this. See if you can see where that, where that demos, where that village, where that us is in these words. I've never voted in an election before this one. The ballot was a concrete reminder, not just rhetoric, that I have power in a democracy. I held the ballot and felt I was no longer a number or a second-class citizen. I voted by absentee ballot on the Sunday before the election as I ran my pen back and forth over the small square space for the candidates I chose to vote for. I felt responsible and powerful. Responsible as a member of our society and powerful to have a say in the process. I closed the envelope, removed the edges, flattened it very gently with a prayer for social and spiritual change in this world. As I ran my hands over the envelope, I truly felt the energy and weight of the small line of choice I had made inside. And I felt chills. That is the spiritual experience of demos. It takes a demos. So let us keep on moving forward. Let us keep on moving forward to widen who is able to sit at the table. Keep on moving forward to broaden the community. Keep on moving forward until our demos truly does include all. Never turn it back. Never turn it back. Amen. And I invite you to sing our closing hymn of the morning. I invite you to rise and bottom the words.